This is lecture nine. In lecture eight, we discussed muscle fiber types and fiber type switching. In this lecture, we'll return to some neuromuscular discussions as we work through Henneman's size principle. Uh, we'll begin with some history, get into the physiology, and we'll end with whether there's evidence of exceptions. Uh, this is a theme we hinted at in lecture two. Here's the very last slide of that lecture. You see today's principle foreshadowed in the bottom right there. It's not a principle we could have covered in that lecture. We needed to get a little bit more foundational information uh, underneath us first. But now uh, we've built that foundation. So since lecture two, we've learned how the brain recruits skeletal muscle, uh, how motor neurons work. Uh, we've gone over the anatomy, both micro and macro of that muscle. And now we have a good understanding of the different muscle fiber types, uh, type 1, 2A, 2X, hybrid fibers, and the other myosin isoforms that we don't care as much about, um, or at least they aren't as important to skeletal muscle performance. Today, we'll talk about the laws of muscle recruitment, um, how the, the neural component and the cellular properties interact. So let's begin with the uh, motor neurons themselves. In the last lecture, we covered the different muscle fiber types. Not all muscle fibers are the same. And accordingly, not all alpha motor neurons are the same either. Uh, as a reminder, the alpha motor neuron is a lower motor nerve that synapses in the ventral root and heads out toward the target tissue. Uh, how thickly its axon is myelinated affects its conduction velocity. Uh, so in the table at the bottom, you see seven different subjects. And the researchers looked at the conduction velocities of a neuron innervating the thenar muscles, the thumb muscles. And the range was between 34 meters per second to 66 meters per second. So to put that on a United States speedometer, uh, it's a little over 2.2 miles per hour for every meter per second. So right in the middle of that, around you know 50 meters per second, that's about 110 miles per hour. Um, 60 meters per second would be about 135. Um, the slowest conduction velocity they observed was about 76. The fastest was about 148 miles per hour. Just think about how fast you could get a car up to on the highway. If there's a long straightaway, and you knew there were no police, like depending on the car, that's about how fast these motor neurons are sending their signals. Um, now, when the signal reaches the muscles, it travels a lot slower. The conduction velocity of your muscle fibers, which means the speed that an action potential travels along its membrane, that might be like two to 10 uh, meters per second. Uh, it depends on the fibers type and diameter, the temperature, maybe pathological conditions. Overall, though, uh, the conduction velocity of the muscles, roughly a tenth of the, of the speed of the motor neuron supplying it. Um, but the excitatory impulse doesn't have to travel very far. It, it doesn't go very far at that point. Uh, the motor neurons are the long highways. Getting the action potential into the muscle itself, that's just the driveway. Um, and you're not going to cut down on the trip time by speeding in the driveway, but you will change the trip time by how fast you take the highway. And these nerves, they have different conduction velocities. Uh, and these different conduction velocities of the motor neurons, they matter uh, because that determines the sequence of firing. Um, upon initiation of motor action, uh, you're lifting a barbell or, or whatever, uh, a motor neuron with a slower conduction velocity will fire earlier. And a motor neuron with a faster conduction velocity will fire later. Uh, now the thickness of the motor nerve and the speed of contraction um, also happens to correspond with the strength of the motor unit's contraction. And that's what we see here. Uh, faster conduction velocities have higher twitch torque, right? more strength. And all of these relationships are what size principle is describing.
Uh, now, it's called Henneman's size principle, uh, but the first people to discover this relationship were not named Henneman. Neither of them had the last name Henneman. Um, the first people to recognize it were Denny Brown and Pennybacker in 1938. Uh, they were working in a lab at Harvard. Uh, that picture there, that's of Denny Brown, Derek Ernest Denny Brown. And they used EMG and noticed a relationship in the recruitment order of skeletal muscles. Um, is there a small, weak contraction? Is there an explosive, like a big, mighty contraction? It always starts in the same place. Uh, it starts with the slowest, weakest, most fatigue-resistant fibers you have. Uh, the tiniest type 1 motor units, those are the first employees on the job. And the biggest, fastest, most uh, energy inefficient, most fatigable fibers that you have, those are the last ones to show up to work. The order is preserved uh, no matter the force of contraction. You know, whether it's a little effort or a big effort, you go through the dark meat first and you get to the white meat last. Um, so you know, isn't that fascinating? Let's call this Orderly recruitment, 1938, right? That's that's Denny Brown and, and Penny Backer. Fast forward the world about two decades, and Elwood Henneman, pictured there in his bow tie, um, he can be found on the exact same campus grounds. He, too, is at Harvard, and he, too, is researching the order of recruitment of skeletal muscle. And he, too, discovers a well-preserved sequence of firing. Uh, he publishes his landmark firing in a really good journal and doesn't cite Denny Brown or Pennybacker, uh, who published an extremely similar finding out of the same institution 19 years before. That's a little bit naughty, seriously frowned on uh, in science, but we forgive Mr. Dr. Henneman, uh, because he did add something substantial to this principle. He contributed that neural component uh, to it. In his early work, he was looking at cat calves, like feline, soleus, and gastroc. And he found that the number of muscle fibers in a motor unit is proportional to the diameter of its motor nerve, of the, of the nerve fiber. Uh, so the larger the nerve, the more fibers in that motor unit. Uh, and the larger motor units, the larger the excitatory stimulus required to excite it. Um, so that's how orderly recruitment works. It's harder to depolarize the larger motor neurons, uh, the ones with thick axons. Um, and accordingly, we refer to those as higher threshold motor units. So very generally how size principle works is the bigger, stronger, faster muscle fibers are housed in bigger motor units and their motor nerves have thicker axons, uh, which have faster conduction velocities, but it takes more excitatory um, uh, stimulus, a, a bigger excitement to get an action potential going in one of them. Uh, it's harder to recruit them. Uh, so think of these bigger, higher threshold motor units like heavy sleepers. You have to shake them awake. Uh, for the really high threshold motor units, you basically need to set off a fire alarm to get them out of bed. By comparison, the type 1 fibers tend to be light sleepers. They live in smaller motor units, um, innervated by nerves with smaller diameters, uh, and they're always ready to fire weekly, right? They're not as fast, they're not as powerful, uh, but they're just rearing to go all the time. The type ones are eager to contribute to whatever task uh, you give them. So let's walk through how size principle works. Uh, and let's say each one of these circles represents a hundred motor units. Uh, if we're in the biceps brachii, you know, maybe you have seven or 800 total motor units, something like that. Um, and on average, each one of those might have 700 or 800 muscle fibers in that. Very average numbers there, though. Uh, not all motor units have the same number of fibers in them as we just learned. Uh, but there are eight circles above. Let's say each of those eight circles represents 100 motor units of varying sizes, smaller on the left, larger on the right, in a bicep. Uh, 
uh, on the far left, we see um, the smaller motor units with type one fibers in them, dark meat, right? Drumsticks and duck breast kind of greasy and delicious, that kind of meat. On the far right, we have our Hulk motor units, right? With the type two X fibers in them white meat, the kind of meat that's like so dry and ungreasy, it's impossible to swallow without a lubricant. And in between those two, those two extremes, numbers one and eight there, are gradations of muscle fibers, of fiber types. Um, near the left, there are going to be plenty of pure one motor units, pure type one motor units. Um, in the middle and mid-right, there are plenty of pure type 2A fibers, uh, and again, at the far right, that's that's pure type 2X. But there are various combinations of hybrid fibers in this spectrum too. Uh, you get it. So if you're going to lift this four pound pink U dumbbell, you're going to use the lowest of low threshold motor units to do it. You're not going to call upon your mighty fibers to move four pounds. You'll just use the slowest, weakest, most fatigue resistant, energy efficient fibers that you have to do it. But then you increase the weight right now, maybe it's up to 12 or 15 pounds and you're, you're going to, um, begin at the onset of tension in rep one, um, you're, well, you're not going to begin here, right? With all of these at the you know third or fourth circle, right? You're always going to begin with the first circle. Still, even though you're lifting a heavier weight, you're going to begin with the first circle sufficient to lift the pink one. And if that proves insufficient, uh, you'll start adding more and more motor units until you've recruited enough to accomplish the task. So you begin at the first circle, then you add the second, then you add the third, you know, then add some motor units in the fourth or whatever, and now you're doing your curls. Uh, but the high threshold motor units, those are still relaxed. Uh, they aren't contributing anything at all. The bulk of your muscle is napping while you're doing these curls, unless you keep curling them until you're in agony. Uh, then some interesting recruitment occurs. We'll talk about that later in this lecture and later in the semester from a more practical uh, standpoint. Uh, but put down the 15s or whatever they were and pick up the 45s, try to curl those. And that's a lot of weight to lift it. You're calling on I don't know, five or six of those circles. Let's say it's 500, 600 motor units, according to this diagram. Um, but you don't begin with all of those muscle fibers just exploding into action. You still have to start down there with the pinks, right? The, the motor units that correspond to those and then add more and more and more motor units to the total until you've recruited enough to complete the bicep curl with this weight. Maybe you're not maxed out though. Uh, maybe you're doing a eight or 10 reps total with a weight that you could do 15 with. Um, if that's the case, you're not activating your biggest, strongest fibers. Those are not helping you curl it. And something else to note, uh, if you don't have a history of resistance training, you may only be able to recruit about this many, maybe three fourths of your fiber or something like that. I mean, try as hard as you want. The high threshold motor units are just sitting there, silent, unwilling to participate. Uh, but if you undergo vigorous training for a period, your body will become more and more permissive uh, with those fibers. It won't police your contractions as oppressively. Um, you know, it'll let you start using those highest threshold motor units over time. And what's the most reliable way to recruit those motor units, to recruit all the fibers within them? Um, among people with a history of training, it's heavy loads. If you have a history of weightlifting and you load up the barbell or the dumbbells or whatever and start heaving them, uh, you'll see these fibers contributing to the cause. Um, but you're not going to start with everything activated. You're still going to sequentially recruit the fibers. That's orderly recruitment, that size principle. Start with the babies and keep adding to it until you finally curl the hundreds. 
um, or take uh, like a more realistic way. Let's change the exercise. Let's say um, we're going to do a 10 RM on bench press. Um, and let, let's say, okay, so a 10 RM, that, that means your 10 repetition maximum, uh, which means you can complete 10 reps on your own without the aid of some spotter. Uh, but if you were to attempt an 11th, you couldn't do it. That's your 10 RM. Um, so let's say your 10 RM bench press is 150 pounds, meaning you can do 10 reps, but you can't do an 11th during that set, the last repetition, that's going to be the hardest, uh, the higher threshold fibers. These are probably de-recruiting already. And there's physiological explanations of fatigue too. That stuff we'll talk about at the end of the semester. But the point is the last repetition will be the hardest, but the second to most difficult repetition, the second hardest repetition, that's probably the first one. Uh, when your muscle newly is accommodating that load, um, part of this, part of this strain, this difficulty during the first rep, you have to ascend Henneman's ladder. You don't just teleport to the top. You have to climb it rung by rung. You do it quickly. You, you climb it quickly. Um, but you have to go through those rungs to reach the top. Uh, the easiest reps in a in a 10 RM are probably reps two and three, maybe four, maybe five. It depends. But we can talk about that later in the semester. A good way to think about this is uh, what stick drivers, um, manual drivers would call popping the clutch. Uh, when you have to push start your car, right, because the battery died. When I lived in Connecticut, I had a terrible 1994 Toyota Celica. It was a stick and it was always dying and I had to push start it. So you get it up to 10 or 15 miles an hour um, and then you can start it in second gear. Um, so in this analogy, the human being pushing the car, that's type one fibers, um, type one motor units, right? Type two fibers those aren't going to fire uh, before the type ones, right? The engine is asleep and it's not going to wake up until the type one fibers have done their job. So once those type ones get the car moving to 10, 12, 15 miles an hour, the engine can fire up and the car can speed off, right? Now the engine is obviously a bunch of type two fibers in this analogy, so type one fibers begin the movement, then type two fibers roar into action um, through fast, but, but gradual gradations. Uh, but the type ones, these aren't very strong uh, and they're not very fast at all. Uh, but if you don't need to do anything strong or fast, they're better, right? These fibers are better for that. But if you do need strength and you do need speed, you have to put the clutch and fire the engine. Uh, but then once that engine is live uh, and you press down on the gas and the car zips off and leaves the human behind, the way behind, I mean, the guy pushing the car, there's no way he can keep up with the car once it's burning gas. If the guy is running 10 miles an hour and the car is driving at 50, even if they're both moving on the same road in the same direction on the same road, the guy is no longer contributing to the car's speed. And there's a similar phenomenon in skeletal muscle. The type two fibers contract way faster than the type ones. Um, so the shortening velocity of the muscle exceeds the capacity of the type ones to contribute in a meaningful way. The neural input is probably still depolarizing the type ones, uh, but their motor action might not be of any value to the external force. If it's something explosive, like a shot put, a baseball pitch, something like that. If it's something slow and strong, sure, um, some value is there. Uh, but the fast rate of type two contraction can outpace uh, the type ones in some contexts. Something else uh, to note is that the de-recruitment happens in the inverse order. The last motor unit to show up to work is the first one to go home. And the first one to show up is the last one uh, to go home. So if we're doing that intense set of bench press from a minute ago, when muscle fibers start throwing in the towel, those are the highest threshold ones. Um, your inner hulks are, are giving up first 
followed by your demi hulks and then your aspiring hulks and so on um, until you get to the puny fibers. Uh, the ones that have been firing since the contraction first began. This is just a visual representation of that, illustrating that you stop contracting in the opposite order that you began. Um, again, the first fiber recruited is the last fiber de-recruited. Um, and as the figure shows, this happens in older adults too. Uh, on the y-axis is the percentage of maximum voluntary contraction. And... Uh, the the uh, force thresholds for recruitment and 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 de recruitment of the motor units those don't change. Uh, the muscle itself may behave a little differently as we age, uh, but across the lifespan we see this pattern preserved. So we've been talking about how size principle works, um, how questions get at mechanisms, why questions are asking about purposes. And what purpose does size principle serve? Before I answer that, uh, let me explain the visual here. We're looking at action potentials. Um, type one motor nerves reach those action potentials easier than type twos. The smaller the neuron, the smaller the membrane surface, and the smaller the membrane surface, the smaller the synaptic current required to depolarize them. So. Uh, that same stimulus that caused the type 1 motor nerve to reach its spike threshold is insufficient to depolarize the type 2s. Uh, it takes a louder stimulus to wake up the sleeping dragons, right? But once they're awake, those are very powerful. Uh, okay, so that's how this works. But why does it work in this way? Uh, I'll let you think about that for a little while. Uh, while I finish this lecture. And at the end of this lecture, we'll return to this slide and I'll explain why size principle is important to your function and survival. Uh, so first, are there exceptions to size principle? Well, yes, there are all sorts of exceptions. Like if you have a decerebrate animal, uh, they're artificially stimulating. Decerebration, this is the separation from uh, cerebral motor control. Um, so this isn't voluntary action, voluntary uh, muscle action. Uh, the electrical stimulation isn't even coming from the animal's body, in this case, the cat's. Um, so this is not really applicable to what we're talking about. Uh, and maybe throughout other parts of the animal kingdom, orderly recruitment is, is governed a bit differently. Um, this seems to be the case here and there. Uh, the principle has some different characteristics, but we don't care about that either. Um, you know, what we care about is human beings doing bicycle scissory kicks um, or human beings leaping up for a rebound. Uh, or human beings doing the shot put as explosively as they can, or any other expression of voluntary maximal performance in a human being. Are there exceptions to size principle under these conditions? According to the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning book, the answer is yes. And to arrive at their yes, they cited uh, three studies. And we'll go through... Um, all three of those studies together, because it's important to understand where claims come from, um, especially claims that have been as influential as these. Uh, it was from these paragraphs that people really propagated the idea that football players and wrestlers and powerlifters could bypass orderly recruitment and just teleport to the top of the ladder. Uh, so let's go through the three studies that were cited in support of those claims. Um, this is the first one. It's from 1989, which is fine, right? The year doesn't matter as long as the study is done well. Uh, but before I break down these studies, all three of them, don't write anything down. Just listen, hear the story passively, and follow along. Uh, it's not important to know a single detail from any of these studies. What's important is the general, the theme of all of this, um, that we should be careful in our citations and, and cautious in our interpretations. 
All right, so back to the study. Uh, there were five subjects total in this one. Uh, four men, one woman, uh, ages 22 to 39. Uh, they got full data from three subjects and didn't control for muscle spindle activity. But, um, it, but this is okay. This is fine. Um, it, it's fine that they only got full data on three subjects. That's all we need to know it, it, is, is whether anyone is capable of doing it. It just needs to be observed in one person. Uh, so like if someone says the human form cannot possibly bench press a thousand pounds, we just need to see one person do it. We don't need to see a sample of people to create a confidence interval around a thousand. We just need one uh, to do it. And it's similar here. So three complete subjects, totally fine. Uh, now, they used 15 to 20% of maximum voluntary contraction through uh, isotonic, concentric plantar flexion uh, and uh, eccentric or eccentric dorsiflexion, um, looking predominantly at the soleus and gastroc. Only two subjects had their soleus measured. Um, surface EMG, all five had their gastroc measured. Uh, but think about what this means, okay? Uh, let's say it's 17.5, 15 to 20%. Let's say it's 17.5% of their maximum voluntary contraction. If this were the bench press and your maximum voluntary contraction were 200 pounds, you wouldn't even be allowed to use the bar, right? That weighs 45 pounds. Uh, you'd need something lighter than that. And so we're using this study to support the premise that athletes can suppress low threshold motor units and instead explode into the high threshold ones, I'm not sure these methods are ideal to answer that question. Um, these are the movements they evaluated. They did try to control for the speed of contraction. They tried uh, and they arbitrarily assigned motor unit groups, you know, one, two, and three based on uh, when they were recruited during plantar flexion. Uh, I'm not sure that's the most repeatable experimental design, but okay. Um, very high threshold motor units were uh, considered to be the ones they couldn't activate during isotonic or ballistic plantar flexion. Uh, they looked at 99 total motor units in three different muscles, not in each subject, but that's the total across all three uh, muscles among all subjects. Uh, talking about their observations in the soleus, uh, that's a predominantly type one muscle, um, much more postural uh, than powerful. Uh, so this is to be expected here. Um, the gastric nemius has a lot higher concentration of type 2 fibers in it, but the EMG is, quote, rather poor. Uh, in addition, the uh, medial gastroc and the soleus, um, in addition to, to these, there's a lateral gastroc to consider, uh, but they only looked at 12 total motor units in the medial gastroc, and that muscle has a lot more than 12 in it. Each subject probably has at least 500 motor nerves uh, for that. And there was you know, 12 that they looked at. Uh, and you know, there are passages like this one uh, in the article that can be a little bit hard to interpret. Um, you know, at what point in the activation they observed the motor units they categorized as high threshold depolarizing. Um, if the study were better controlled, we could make better sense of recruitment patterns, a little bit better sense. Um, but this is one of their visuals and the scattered dots that represents their kind of poorly executed isometric ramp protocol, um, gradually increasing the torque and, and seeing which motor units fire. Uh, the soleus is, again, mostly a type one muscle. Um, some of the gastroc EMG data were poor and the gastroc is where you'd see a higher percentage of type twos and the VHT section on the right, um, the very high threshold. Uh, motor units, These, this is what they were unable to activate in either the isometric ramp protocol or the ballistic protocol. And notice the gastroc, um, lateral and medial, uh, they combined them here, is well represented in the VHT section. Um, so the more you read this article, the less it speaks to the claim uh, that was made in the textbook. Getting into their concluding remarks, they're attributing the EMG of lengthening 
uh, muscles. I'm not sure what this means. Um, every muscle action is a contraction, but I assume what they're talking about is eccentric or eccentric actions. And concentric and eccentric do have several important differences, but their um, second sentence there is much more illuminating. Um, our results shed no light on, you know, uh, go on. Uh, I would take that sentence in a little bit different direction and say they just, they don't really shed any light on size principle or orderly recruitment. That said, uh, these authors, it's not their fault that they were cited inappropriately. Um, they did their study and people who choose to cite them inappropriately, that's not these authors' fault. Um, okay, so what are the other two studies? Uh, here's one of them. This is from 1986, right? A few years earlier. Again, the year doesn't matter, but it was on rats. Okay, first off, um, that's not humans. Uh, you, we do have some notable differences between us and rats, including muscle fiber types, right? They have type 2B, which is even faster than type 2X, but okay, what you do with the rats, right? Maybe there's something compelling here based on your methods. Oh, you inserted electrodes and applied stimulation? I'm unimpressed. I'm not unimpressed with the study, but it's application, right? Over here, we have human beings competing in the vertical jump. And then over here, we're chopping up rats and attacking them with lightning, right? These are unrelated phenomena. Um, the study is perfectly fine, but it was cited inappropriately. Moving into the third and final study that was cited, uh, this one's from 1982, uh, and it is evaluating humans, uh, and it is measuring voluntary contraction, uh, but it isn't evaluating orderly recruitment. It's testing size principle to a degree, uh, but it has nothing to do with sequential firing. So what did they do? They had three subjects seated comfortably in a dental chair, and they had them do isometric flexion uh, and extension of the elbow, uh, isometric supination and pronation of the wrist, the forearm, uh, and isometric internal and external rotation of the humerus. Those were the movements that they had them do. Um, and they found that motor units get activated at different uh, flexion forces, right? Depending on the task. So, you know, during a bicep flexion, some particular motor unit was not activated until force reached 1.83. You know, during supination, it was not activated until we, uh, this. This is the story. Um, during different motions, um, motor units are activated differently. Um, so think like if I'm doing lunges and squats and leg extensions and plyometrics, the characteristics of recruitment will change to match the demands. That's not size principle. Um, or to put it into terms more applicable to this article, um, if you're sitting in a dental chair and you're doing hammer curls, you'll rely more on the brachialis. Um, if you supinate your wrist and repeat the curl, you'll rely more on the biceps brachii. Again, that's not size principle. That's just selecting whole muscle groups with origins and insertions more fit to the task you're completing. That's what this is describing. Uh, now, again, uh, we're looking at a small number of motor units. There are three subjects and 17 motor units in all. How many motor units do you have in your biceps brachii? Let's take a look, right? Here's a different article, uh, not something that was cited. We're just answering the question, how many motor units are in your biceps? Um, and so this study had 40 subjects, pretty evenly divided between males and females. Um, there's a lot, right? There's a lot of motor units. We're talking about the brachialis here too, but let's just say it's 700 or so uh, motor units in, in the biceps. Now, as people age, they lose a lot of them. So the older subjects had much lower numbers than the younger subjects did. Um, all right, let's get back to the study we've been talking about, the third cited study, um, and, and return to this particular slide. All three subjects were young, okay? They were in their 20s. But let's just say they only had, they had 500 each, right? Each of them has 500. 
17 total motor units were tested. Uh, and the finding they're reporting is that those motor units behave differently depending on the different tasks, depending on the different muscle actions. Um, now, some of them were recruited by flexion and not by supination or external rotation. Others were dependent on supination or external rotation. Um, you know, so, you know, some motor units in the biceps fired with specific tasks, other motor units contributed, um, to, you know, then one task, like that, even just reading this thing, the word then with an E there's grammar errors, uh, in it. So getting into these conclusions, um, but if, if you're, if you're watching this, uh, blink lightly, Okay, like the person in the in the picture, all talk slowly, right? So you have a chance to do your blink uh, without missing a slide. Just a light blink and then open your eyes again. Okay, now blink really hard. Okay, I mean, blink with all your might. Additional motor units are being recruited to accomplish this. Uh, I mean, if you're actually playing along with me here in this in this activity, you put your mouth into it. If you blinked as hard as you could, your mouth was involved in the blinking of your eyes. Okay, now the last activity is to smile casually, just smile. Okay, now what does this tell us? At a much lower threshold, you'll recruit your smiling muscles. Now, does this have anything to do with size principle? I mean, does that mean a football player can skip lower threshold motor units when going in for a tackle? Or is this just different muscles and their motor units you know, serving different functions in the body? That's all this is. So let's return to the book, their key point. Maybe this is true. It might be. It seems entirely reasonable that the order of recruitment isn't perfectly fixed. But the cited evidence for these claims that athletes are inverting the size principle is uncompelling. Uh, and it becomes more interesting uh, when we start investigating phenomena like post-activation potentiation, things like this. But we'll get to that in the next lecture. Uh, before then, for the rest of this lecture, what do we know about climbing Henneman's ladder? What's the most dependable way to activate high threshold motor units? load the tissue, right? Lots of studies use maximum voluntary contraction to get a maximum motor unit activation in whatever tissue they're, they're looking at. Does that mean it's the only way to achieve uh, recruitment of those fibers? No, but first let's look at an example of how maximum voluntary contraction associates with uh, maximal recruitment. As an example, uh, in this study, the authors looked at the percentage of total muscle fiber recruitment during isometric activation of the tibialis anterior at right, front of the calf at various loads, 10% um, of their maximum capacity, 25% of their maximum capacity, 50%, 75%, 100% of their maximum capacity. And they found a linear relationship in which higher loads associated with more motor units being recruited um, when the subjects were holding those isometric loads for six to 10 seconds, not until failure, but they were holding it for six to 10 seconds. Had those trials gone on until failure, it's likely, I mean, almost guaranteed, but I'll just say likely that the higher threshold fibers would have been recruited as soon as they were needed. Maybe not in the 10% trial, but in the others, especially 50 and 75%, you're gonna activate the higher threshold motor units. Um, because time matters too. Uh, if you do an isometric hold and hold it and hold it and hold it, you'll eventually climb the ladder out of pure need. Need is what really determines size principle. Load is a major ingredient of need, the most important ingredient, but it's not the only ingredient. Now, this study um, tested endurance of a hand muscle, the first dorsal interosseous, we've mentioned this one previously in the semester, uh, by intermittent isometric activation at 
of their maximum strength. Uh, and as the exercise progressed, they found higher threshold motor units being recruited to contribute to the force production out of need, right? Higher threshold motor units were needed to maintain uh, force output. In this study, uh, the subjects, they did concentration curls, a type of bicep curl at either a 5RM, meaning do five reps with a weight that you can't do six of, uh, or a 10RM or a 20RM. Uh, now a 20 RM, that's going to be painful because you would fail on the 21st rep, but you get through all 20 of them. And what they found was most of the motor units were activated in all three conditions, 5 RM, 10 RM, and 20 RM. Uh, recruitment of the higher threshold fibers happened immediately. I mean, almost immediately in the 5 RM sets. Uh, but it was still achieved later in the set uh, during the 10 RM and the 20 RM sets. Um, as fatigue set in, as need or, or, arised, the, the larger, stronger fibers, these can pick up uh, some of the tab. Uh, now to figure all, all this out, you know, that it's like 95%, you know, what's the 5% missing? How do they figure this out? They used EMG and interpolated twitch. Um, now, interpolated twitch is like a really extreme e-stim. Uh, you, you put on those electrodes, turn the e-stim machine on, uh, and you feel your muscle buzzing and vibrating. Um, interpolated twitch is a is a savage version of that, uh, where electrical stimulus is superimposed on a maximum voluntary contraction. So let's see if you have any extra twitch left in you. Uh, but this illustrates that size principle isn't based strictly on load. It's based mostly on load, uh, but duration and angles and speed and other variables contribute uh, to the muscle's behavior. Um, now, depending on the muscle and the characteristics of the load, Maybe it's possible to recruit all the mo the motor units um, using a load that's just thirty percent of your maximal strength in other muscles and in other contexts. Maybe it's seventy five percent that's needed, something like that. But no matter what, you can be sure that skeletal muscle will accommodate the demands in the safest most efficient, most effective way possible, which brings us back to, this slide. Uh, we've been talking all about how this works, but why is human skeletal muscle bound to this principle? With most physiological phenomena, the purpose is either promotion of reproduction or self-preservation. And this one doesn't seem to have anything to do with reproduction. It's about survival. Task-appropriate recruitment helps it helps with us, uh, with our survival. Um, so if you get up and walk to the bathroom and you're using your type 2X fibers, you're not going to make it, right? You're going to have to stop for a break halfway. You know, maybe a couple of breaks, depending on how far away the bathroom is. And maybe you'll need a snack too, right? These fibers expend way more energy. They expend energy way faster than your type 1 fibers. Um, the type 1 fibers in small motor units should be, I mean, almost exclusively used throughout the day. They're much more energy efficient. Um, so they'll accomplish whatever your task is on a third of the energy budget. Uh, they have great structural integrity. They don't fatigue easily. I mean, these are the most reliable fibers you have, the type 1s. You should absolutely use them for every task they're capable of performing, but they're not capable of performing every task, right? Survival also occasionally insists on strength and speed, uh, especially in, you know, earlier ages when our genomes were being assembled, not when we were young, but when our species was young. If all we had was type ones, our ancestors would have died every time a feat of strength was required, um, just as they would have starved if their locomotive energy costs were tripled, right? Our ancestors 
they they didn't have the caloric surplus that we do to expend exorbitant energy on mundane tasks. So size principle is critical to the survival. Uh, it was to our ancestors, um, to their survival, but it also um, gives us a framework to talk about some practical applications, uh, which we'll do in the next lecture. Um, but here are some questions you should be able to answer from this lecture. And in the next one, uh, we'll get to a few practical applications. Not all of the applications uh, of the entire semester, but some that are related to this content. Uh, and with that, I will see you in lecture 10.